put into the criminal code. I think it should be taken out. It should be done and in a medical way so that these people could be sent to centers if we feel as citizens who oppose the feeling of this illness and this homosexuality so that they could be rehabilitated. There are facets of mental illness that are not particularly pretty. And although these things are no longer discussed behind closed doors, is it necessary to bring them into print or display? Some, many of us were so proud of the fact that uh, it was Jane had published her book. We bought several copies and gave them away to our friends. And I remember I gave one to one person and uh, he read it and came back to me and said, is, is, it about, is it really about that? And I said, yes, it's about that. She was in the supermarket buying grapefruit and she had a grapefruit in each hand. And Jane is quite tall, as you know, and there she was standing with these grapefruits, one in either hand, like Pomona, goddess of the orchards. And this short woman came up and started screaming at her about the immorality of her book. And her reaction to this was one part horror, two part comedy. Should she hit the woman with the grapefruit? What was she supposed to do? <laughs> what was she supposed to say? What do you say when somebody starts lambasting you about the immorality of a book that they probably haven't read and certainly haven't understood? So she just stood there with her grapefruits, smiling down benignly. I think women passed that book around until there were dog-eared copies all over the continent. Um, and for, for many reasons, either because they were afraid to go buy a copy on their own or simply because it was so important to them that they needed to share it with friends. I wasn't at all prepared for the kind of public demand that was made on me after Desert of the Heart came out because a lot of people read that book and felt that I was the only person in the world who could understand their position. You have to know when you're a public person that there are dangers for you that you be can become a target simply because of what you represent. And certainly I have been stalked. I have had threatening mail. I've had hate mail. And I suppose there have been particular moments when I have been afraid. The only time I remember being afraid was watching James Baldwin on the stage and thinking he is so vulnerable. And I suppose it was a transferred fear of my own. I started out wanting to be a doctor until I took chemistry. And when I got the Bunsen burner to blow up all the tubes, and then finally when I was cleaning the tubes, the spine was stuck in the bottom, I decided to change careers. I was about 13. And I really wanted to tell the truth. I felt as if an awful lot of people around me were not telling the truth about how they felt or how the world really was. And so with that kind of kid arrogance and uh, longing for honesty, I started to write for that purpose, not for any great literary uh, ambition but just to say what I thought was true. This is not for you. I wrote it from the point of view of one character and in the first person, so that by the time I got through with that book, I felt as if I had lockjaw. I began to realize that the whole tradition of a hero or a main character in the novel is, for me, antithetical to what I think about how we live in the world. Though we would all like to be the main characters of the world, we're not. We are mainly members of community. And that's what I really wanted to write about. Where you find community, what community is, and how people interact in community. And that's really been the subject of my work ever since. The question to ask about fear is not what are you afraid of, but what do you want? If you know what you want, and you can have it, then fear doesn't seem like fear at all. 
If Allison could walk out at the end of the concert tonight, not betrayed back into the threatening loneliness of people who only moments before belonged to the same great affirmation of order and harmony, and now had nothing to share but petty, conflicting appetites. She is above all a writer. She cares about language. She cares about making language say things it hasn't been able to say before. She cares about mining the, the power of language and making that language available fully to a community rather than becoming a sort of caricaturist or an illustrator for that community. There is, of course, pressure from readers and viewers to have role models for lesbians. My own sense about role models is that you only need bad ones. You can say, I'm certainly not going to be like that when I grow up. And good ones simply get in the way of your developing into the person you uh, are destined to be. The only audience I write for is myself five years later. I want it to be so clear that I don't have to remember that the prose calls it back to me. Roxanne wanted to make a sound map of the city. The moment the idea occurred to her, she realized that it was a project she was already in the middle of. At first she intended only to make notes, a word or two to remind her of the sound she had recorded or wanted to record. But Roxanne began to see the map as a thing in itself, as well as a score for work to be done. She cut pictures out of magazines. Everything from air conditioning units to national flags. The directions were color-coded. Green to indicate what did happen on that particular corner. Red to indicate what might happen. And gold to suggest what should happen. If she had to tell the truth, she had in mind a cast of thousands, involving everyone from school children to professionals. She wanted marching bands of tape recorders. She wanted 50 oboes on 50 different street corners playing 50 different national anthems in their natural tone of complaint. And that was just the beginning. She wanted this performance to go on for days, for weeks, forever. A display of sound as permanent as sculpture which would transform the city. When I think of Jane Rule's novels as a, as a whole, and I think of all of them together, and think of the progression in her books, the thing that stands out to me is mapping, the way that she's sort of a, a cartographer of communities. And she, will, uh, she has herself crossed a lot of borders, and so borders are an interesting image for her. But I think what she does is she'll, she'll map communities by um, showing new possibilities, new new intersections, new contexts that are that are possible. And she does that with cities like Vancouver, but she also does it with um, groups of people who are very different, who may be together by chance and then need to work out for themselves some sort of uh, some sort of plan to continue to exist. <laughs> fifties or sixties, if they made a film about lesbians in Hollywood, they would have the traditional Hollywood happy ending. That is, one woman would kill herself and the other one would get married. And I was not about to give permission for that. And I had sent her a letter just telling her how much I loved the book and how much I wanted to make the film and that I had made documentaries prior to that, but this was going to be my first feature film if she was going to sell me the rights. And she suggested that I go out to Borrego Springs in the desert, just two hours outside of Los Angeles, and meet with her and talk about it. So when Jane came down to Borrego Springs, I went out there schlepping my 16 millimeter projector and all the films I'd ever made and decided to do a little show and tell. And so I set up my screen in Jane's trailer out there in the trailer camp and uh, showed all my 16 millimeter documentaries. She showed me every film she'd ever made. 
And at the end of talking with her about it, I said, I don't think you can make a film of Desert of the Heart, but you can certainly use the book to make your own film and use whatever in it you need to make your own film. And that's what happened. I think that I chose Desert of the Heart for its central metaphor, if I were to reduce it all to one thing, because the idea of, of gambling and what was at risk for both of these characters was very appealing to me on the level of story, on the visual level. And then I thought somewhere in the middle of all that, that I should take the line in the movie that expressed, you know, the central metaphor. If you don't play, you can't win. And so there I am, you know, the, the Hungarian gambler, even though that's not even a Hungarian accent. <laughs> When I was 10 years old, I put on my first pair of glasses and saw individual leaves on trees, the small stones which made up the gravel drive, the letters on the street signs. You mustn't mind that you have to wear glasses, my mother said. Mind? Since no one else in the family did wear glasses, I was the only one to understand what a miracle they were. I was the only one who could choose, if I felt like it, to retreat again into that soft, vague world of the nearsighted where other people's concerns and even identities blurred, where I could look with new eyes and read a world that I'd only guessed at before. Certainly, my childhood in my family was a very nurturing, a very generous world that I lived in. We were, once the Depression struck, very poor for quite a while. But you feel absolutely blessed. The, the world outside that home was often very tough. But inside it was, was very nourishing. In California, I went to an integrated school with um, black children and Chinese and Japanese children with migrant workers' children. When I got to St. Louis, uh, the whole area was segregated. And I think I learned very early about all sorts of things, that it was very important for you to learn the rules wherever you lived, if you were going to survive, but you didn't believe that they were true. You just knew they were essential. And that distinction, for me, as young as I was, gave me a kind of independence from convention that I don't think children get if they grow up in the same place and don't have a, a way to compare attitudes, manners, as I did. I have probably said too often that in college I studied the great liars in order to learn to tell the truth, but the curriculum at a women's college in the late 40s and early 50s offered very little which could give me any insight into my own life. Aside from a few poets like Emily Dickinson, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and Eleanor Wiley, whom I'd found for myself in high school. Shakespeare, Auden, Dunn, Herbert, and Hopkins were the only writers who gave me personal nourishment in my college years. Is it significant that at least six of the eight were attracted to their own sex? I didn't know that at the time. It would have been a great revelation and no small comfort in those years of denied feeling, of silence. So she would have been going to college in the 50s. And that was probably the tightest point to go to college, the time when she went. Uh, by the time I got there, it, it, was, it was imitation beatnik and existentialism, so we were a bit loose. But I think the, when Jane went, it was really that plaid skirt, the pearl button earrings, the white gloves, being a lady having a perm. I mean, it must have been just intolerable. <laughs> and then when I graduated from college, I went to England and lived in London for a year and wrote my first unpublishable novel there. And London is still the city of my heart. It was a time when I felt totally focused in myself. I was away from the States, I was away from family, I was living with a woman I was in love with, and I'd had no experience of rejection of work or anything else. I was just being a writer, and I can remember getting chillblains on my hands, because we lived in a cold water flat, and we're poor as church mice. 
And I thought, oh, this will look grand in my biography when I've suffered like this. So it, it was. It was a silly, wonderful, romantic. And so when I ran out of money, that was it. I had to go back to the States. Helen and I met because we taught at the same school at Concord. In fact, we corresponded before I got there because we were team teaching a course. We actually met in a hurricane. Uh, coming up the train from New York to Boston. We didn't know it was a hurricane at the time, but it was Hurricane Hazel, a very famous one. And I was living in at the school, and Helen was living in a nearby town. During the time that McCarthy was riding high in the States, not only were people being forced to take a loyalty oath if they taught at the universities, but it was very clear that he was going to use the popular notion that communists were homosexuals. So if you found a homosexual, you know you had a communist, and therefore you could throw them out of whatever organization they were in. So for any of us who wanted to teach, it was a very, very uncomfortable time, a time that uh, we felt very vulnerable. You had to have lived in Concord for three generations before you made friends. And I was young and arrogant and did not do very well as a servant schoolmistress. So I was glad to get out. I also wanted time to write. For Helen, it was much more difficult because she was still married and it was a matter of deciding to leave her husband and join me. I had never seen Vancouver. I arrived on a beautiful August day into that world of city, sea, and mountains and thought, I've, I've arrived in heaven. Vancouver was not really a city when I first came. It was a setting for a city. You know, Torontonians used to say, Toronto is a city. Vancouver is a room with a view. I did freelance radio broadcasting, TV script reading, paper marking, and tutoring for the English department at the University of British Columbia. Helen accepted a full-time teaching position with the English department. We have been able, each of us, to pursue a career, Helen, with university teaching, I with writing and teaching combined, where there was enough <clears throat> space for each of us to function independently. We were so close to Jane and Helen. They were the kind of people that we felt at ease with. We went to her for advice. There was something, there was a kind of a wisdom growing there that, that one could see. And of course, she already had this desire to be a writer. It was your life. You wrote, that was what you did. The way you met people, talked with people, watched people, listened to people, it was all novelist stuff. And, and I would come home from school, from working, and the house had a kind of hum in it that was the work that was ongoing. Of course, when you were writing, even if you weren't at your desk, if you were in a novel, you were writing all the time. It was there behind your eyes. It was there in the turn of your head. So I didn't live with a not yet published person. I lived with a person who was a writer. Social life in Vancouver was in private houses. And we used to have joint parties with English Department and Longshoremen. And they worked out far better than parties that were more narrowly defined. If you get English department people together by themselves, they talk about how many papers they have to mark and what a louse the head of the department is, and it's pretty dull. Mix them with longshoremen and they get lively. There was quite a community of artists and writers, and this is who would turn up at Jane's and Helen's parties. They knew a lot of painters, and they knew a lot of poets. I, I met Bill Bissett that year, how, because there was one of these happenings, and a happening would have kind of flashing lights and various things going on and I was standing at a table looking at some part of this happening and I felt a furry thing going between my legs 
And indeed, it was Bill Bissett. Very often, uh, Jane would get into some really warm arguments, especially with, uh, I remember, with Jack Shadbolt, where he would take one side and she'd take the other. The ferment that occurred here, as a result of these people meeting together as friends, created the kind of atmosphere that led to further, further invention, further creativity, further uh, ventures into, into new ideas. But we had fun as well. Jane has a great sense of humor. And by that, I don't just mean that she can be very funny. I mean that if you have a sense of humor like that, you also have a sense of balance. So that if things get go too far in, in one direction, ideologically or in any other way, Jane finds it absurd. She has a highly developed sense of the absurd. But she does lead a principled type of life and so does Helen. She has that New England kind of conscience and uh, I think going through, being from the United States and going through the McCarthy era really uh, brought you face to face with your principles and what you were willing to undergo because of them. You know, whether you were going to just stand silently by and watch people be wrongly accused and dragged through the mud or whether you were going to take a stand of some time, kind and get in trouble. So she's, you know, Jane has taken stands because of her principles that have got her in trouble. And I think she's done that quite clearly with her eyes open, knowing she was going to get in trouble. She didn't just blunder into these things. <laughs> For three and a half hours, police searched the offices of the newspaper Body Politic. Their warrant said they were looking for documents that could relate to charges of distributing immoral material by mail. The Body Politic started in November 1971. It was a gay liberation magazine and news journal. In December 1977, the Body Politic published its 39th issue, which included an article called Men Loving Boys Loving Men which was uh, an analysis of pedophilic relationships. It was a serious article. It was dealing with transgenerational relationships seriously. It was not a pornographic essay. I give me an old-fashioned husband, an old-fashioned wife, with some old-fashioned kids day out and day in. Anita Bryant was rampant. Emmanuel Jacquez had been murdered on Young Street earlier that year, which made issues of anything to do with young people very sensitive. And always, issues to do with young people are sensitive. Uh, many people were very angry at us for publishing that article. Hey, I, I hate to use the word publication because it's the filthiest piece of garbage that I've seen in a long time. It may be. It's sickening. There was some media attention to this by the Toronto Sun. It's not the sort of thing that uh, that I want the homosexual groups to get into the schools, which is really the main area where they want to get in, and they'll tell you this themselves, um, and preach their gospel of homosexuality to impressionable kids. I don't want that to happen. One of the reasons that the body politic was criticized for that article was that it did inspire the kind of hate literature. It did seem to give permission to people to spew all the homophobia that they generally keep more under wraps. I felt as if I could help the body politic by agreeing then to write a series of articles for them and to write for them as long as they were in court. I thought this would probably be a year or two. In fact, it went on for five years because the, each time they were found innocent, uh, the government appealed until even writers like June Colwood and Margaret Atwood were taking out ads in the Globe and Mail asking the government to lay off because it was perfectly obvious that the paper was being persecuted and that what they were trying to do was not win the case. They knew they couldn't, but to bankrupt us. Dear Jane, where to begin? Life has been quite full since you were here. Your visit provided a sane and quiet moment in the midst of some very hectic times. 
The word silence comes up often, so much a theme in so much of our work. Everything from lies, secrets, and silence, to pornography and silence, to silence equals death. And it's true, all we have to do is speak, and we're shocking. On the Saturday night after you left, there was a demonstration to protest the raids on us and Glad Day. Ironically, many of us dreaded that demo more than we ever feared being booked, fingerprinted, or mugshot by the police. Nothing makes me more nervous and fearful than the realization that my friends, my lover, are put in danger by what's been going on. All my motherly instincts come to the fore when Michael, my lover of the past 16 months, younger than me, decided to attend the demonstration after the raid. Sending sexual acts is established, limited only by the rights of others, no homosexual behavior will be protected because anything any of us does is offensive to the majority. Policing ourselves to be less offensive to that majority is to be part of our own oppression. Tokenism has never been anything else. Where is the homophobia coming from? I think it comes at the extreme end of a society that is anti-sexual. And, you know, m my sense is that heterosexuals have been taught to be decently ashamed of their own sexuality. And then here come these people who are saying, uh, we're proud to be homosexual. Now, if they're decently ashamed, certainly we should be at least as decently ashamed as they are. And if we're not, we really are shocking to them. And I've always wanted to organize heterosexual pride days so that we could teach them to feel OK about their sexuality. And then I think they would give us less of a bad time. Jane has a reputation for being a wonderful educator about homophobia. And she has a swimming pool on Galliano Island. And the kids of the island all get to come over there and, and swim between two and four every day during the summer. So there were these little boys, you know, seven, eight years old, all fighting at the end of the pool. And Jane put a stop to all of that and beckoned one of the little boys over, you know, and said, what's going on down there? Why are you fighting and carrying on? And he said, because they're calling me homo. They're calling me a homo. And Jane said, well, what does that mean to you? And he said, well, I don't want to be a homo. Ooh, that's disgusting. Who wants to be a homo? And Jane said, well, I'm a homo. And he said, you are? With who? And she said, with Helen. And this little boy, his eyes just went from Jane to Helen to Jane to Helen. I mean, he could hardly grasp, you know, this concept. And so then went paddling away, and I guess thought about it for the next 15 years or something. <laughs> Dear Rick, a busy pool today, full of mainly boy bodies, the sun shining again. I was rather firm with the boys, saying things like, do think up a game less disgusting than that one, and to Mike, you duck one more kid and I'll take you out of the pool. I want them all to grow up to be the kind of men I love and trust. And of course, not many of them will, but I want to tinge them with my hope. Do you remember this guy actually bites you? Ow. Oh. Make the noise with the saw. Everybody's Stop lost in that one. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the whale book. Here we go. So I think the greater openness about discussing what relationships really are about and how they work, and to be open to answering questions of children, and to acknowledge their own sexual desires, and to deal with those in talking about sexuality as a language. And that as you learn how to talk and how to express your emotions, so you also learn about your sexuality, that you can do beautiful things with it, you can do mean things with it, you can do anything with it, you can communicate hatred, you can communicate love. And you have to learn how to use your sexuality as gracefully as you learn any of the languages that you speak. When the relative
relatively simple task of teaching table manners takes so many years, why do we assume that sexual manners need not be taught at all? There is always the possibility of exploitation in any relationship. It certainly increases when one person has more power than the other, that is, an adult with a, a younger person. I think the sense of appropriate use of power is another thing we have to teach. And if we are silent about it, we leave our children really undefended. And the people who are now teaching children about appropriate touching, about saying that their bodies belong to themselves and that they can refuse anything that feels to them invasive of their own privacy is a very important thing but it's only part of the teaching you don't want to teach them simply to say no you have to teach them also that it's a delight to be intimate and to watch their evolving needs and and desires in those ways 105 North Avenue, Vancouver police were called to Little Sisters bookstore last night. A bomb was planted on the landing, the third bombing here in four years. Little Sisters has been in the news lately because it's taking Canada Customs to court for seizing its books at the border. When? Yeah, how many boxes are that one? Uh, for Little Sisters, Vancouver? Doesn't say how many boxes? <laughs> I feel it's important for me to go to court to testify in the Little Sisters trial that has to do with customs seizing books going into gay bookstores because we should not leave our moral judgment in the hands of customs officers. Having our reading censored by people without any judgment or real moral authority when we shouldn't be censored even by people who have I'm opposed to pornography as a bad teacher, but I'm also opposed to censorship because I think that those people who are in control, like the customs officials and the male people in the legislature, are all really going to use censorship to silence sexual minorities, not to get rid of pornography, because pornography is a kind of policeman. Nice women don't see it. If you see it, you're in the wrong place. If you see it, it will put you in your place. And so they really are not interested in getting rid of that, although they say they are. They use the laws to go after the body politic, to seize my books at the border, not to get rid of the hard pornography. I think that you have to make a distinction between images and reality always. One of the problems that censorship laws pretend to solve is that they pretend to solve violence in the society. It's very cheap to censor. It's very expensive to have battered women shelters. Our present government is happy to pass a law against images of violence against women, but they are not happy to fund battered women shelters. And I think we've got to keep making that clear distinction. Not that I like some of the images that are coming in. I don't like Pat Califia's work. I don't think she is either very honest or very wise. She is preoccupied with sex and violence. So was Dante. It's easier to argue on aesthetic grounds for the defense of Dante. But the Inferno is the Inferno. Whether you write it well or write it badly, it's sadistic torture. Now, if it's real in the world, we better understand it. Women don't have to fall into the traps of the moral majority by demanding censorship, which will be politically abused. It seems to me shocking that people only complain about violence when it's turned against women or children, and that we don't complain when we see images of men over and over again beating each other up, shooting each other, crashing into each other with cars, and that this is all okay. And then we wonder why our boy children get images of violent behavior uh, written into their text. 
And I think we don't take responsibility. And I do think that we also solve our male problem by having wars so that we send our randy young men off to kill and rape other people and get out of our area till they're tired or dead. I think we have a terrible attitude toward men in our society. A terrible sense of how... Uh, here are mothers with gold stars in their window because they have proudly given their sons. But alas, it goes right back to the great Christian image of God so loving the world that he gave his only son to the cross. It's a hell of a way to love. Illness, accident, and death are not punishments for anything but being born. All our defenses, personal and social, are temporary. All that lives, dies. Whatever justice and mercy there are, are not divine at all, but human. And however faulty and frail they are, however finally defeated, they are the only tools we have in the face of crisis. A morality based on a fear of death is so ridiculous it should be the source of comedy. All sins are mortal. All virtues are too. Equally are youth and beauty, age and pain. Neither is it true that only the good die young nor that only the wicked are punished. Morality has nothing to do with death. It has to do with living. When you're doing political work and you're involved in a political cause, which we both were in various ways, um, you don't actually stay angry all the time. Your anger actually becomes something that's underneath. Uh, and one of Jane's words that she used a lot is, was dailiness, how you establish a sense of dailiness in your approach to the world. Dear Rick, why brush your teeth in the morning? Why eat breakfast? Why say I love you? Everything that's important you do over and over again. Certainly fighting against censorship is nothing that ever is going to go away and that will have to be done every day of our lives if we are to protect those values that we cherish. Both Helen and I are very political and we found it increasingly awkward to have no political say where we lived. And since we really felt enormously welcome in Vancouver, and with jobs that we liked, and a life that we liked, it became clear to us that we were not probably going to go back to the States. And therefore, we should take responsibility uh, for our political selves and be citizens so that we could participate. <laughs> Landscape in my early writing was a very tentative thing, partly because I moved around so much when I was a child, that I didn't really feel I owned a landscape. I didn't know the names of the flowers, I forgot the names of the streets fairly soon. It wasn't until I had lived in Vancouver for quite a while that I began to feel that there were landscapes that I actually could inhabit and own. But I'm still very respectful of them. I envy Virginia Woolf criticized for putting a flower in the, in the garden that only bloomed in Scotland. And she said, it's my garden. I can put in it what I want. I still don't have my garden in that sense. I'm still very careful about the accuracy of landscape. Her books have followed her own path up from the California coast to British Columbia, to Vancouver, and finally to Galliano Island. And the landscape is metaphoric in many ways, but I think it's also real. I think she cares deeply about the land, and that comes to be almost a character in her fiction. Galliano is the nearest Gulf Island to the mainland, and so it's only a 50-minute ride by ferry from Tawasson. we spent nearly every weekend here. In fact, the partying in Vancouver had gotten so intense that we really needed a place to escape. But I also wanted to be away from Vancouver and its distractions to concentrate on my writing. I've written my last five books since we moved here.
she said that about her great-grandfather. She had no idea where he was buried. One of the Gulf Islands was all her father had ever said, aside from telling her not to be an ancestor worshipper. She was to be 150% Canadian, the way he pretended to be. But she often walked down here and looked at that Japanese grave. And though she couldn't read the characters, it had given her some sense of her roots. If it wasn't likely to be the grave of her great-grandfather, it could have been. Only claiming it like that had turned it into a lie. She'd never look at that grave again without burning embarrassment. I'll never belong here, she thought, or anywhere. And as bleak as that thought was, it had an odd comfort in it, perhaps because it was the truth. For the first time, her inheritance from her mother occurred to her as a blessing. She was, after all, free to make her own terms with the world. Why on earth had she been hanging around the edges of other people's lives when she had her own? The world out there beyond this little island was full of people, among whom there might be someone she could risk wanting on her own terms. Ah, dear Rick, why is a star a word for the exceptional, when in fact there are so many shining ones, every night right there? I'll confess to something else. I don't find the moon a bit erotic, big bloated creature or anorexic, pretending to be the biggest thing in heaven, as if we didn't know perspective. Surely the chief virtue of being in love is the intensity of feeling, the being so alive, and the openness to intimacy with all it can teach. For those whose work has nothing to do with human insight, it may seem a dangerous distraction, rationalized only by idealizing the beloved. But for those whose love is basic to learning, the idealizing isn't necessary, in fact, gets in the way of the real value of the experience, which is to know really to know another. And we used to say, laughingly, that we didn't believe in long-term relationship. That, you know, what was the value of simply having been together for so many years? And then after some time, Helen said, you know, it's probably not a thing we should keep saying, since we seem to be an example of a long-term relationship. But of course, when we talked to students, and they wanted to discuss long-term relationships, we discovered they meant anything that lasted over a month. So. It's all relative. On a winter's day, while a blizzard raged through the streets of Toronto, Lila Kemp... We've never really depended on each other for our identity, and I suppose that's the thing I watch in relationships that makes them finally fall apart, because each person is propping up something in the other. I suppose Helen and I have always wanted to live up to each other, wanted to be the best that we are for each other. Get in. Lila it is not the length, but the quality of life that matters to me. More easily said now that I am over 50. But it has always been important to me to write one sentence at a time, to live every day as if it were my last, and judge it in those terms, often badly, not because it lacked grand gesture or grand passion, but because it failed in the daily virtues of self-discipline, kindness, and laughter. It is love, very ordinary human love, and not fear, which is the good teacher and the wisest judge. that still sees any sexual activity not linked with procreation as perverse, whether between children, people of the same sex, or old people, we need to rediscover erotic tenderness for old age in its lusts and pains, its beauty and fragility. A couple of years ago, I was visiting with Jane Rule on Galliano Island, and I asked her what she was working on. And she said, I have retired. I have stopped writing. 
And I was just caught short because I was so disappointed to learn that we wouldn't have any more fiction to look to. I am a, an obsessive worker. I work long hours when I work, and to write a novel takes a kind of concentration that it is increasingly difficult for me to maintain because I have arthritis and because I take an anti-inflammatory drug. The reason it was possible for me to make this decision, however, is that I realized that a lot of what I was thinking about writing I'd already written. And it does seem to me that writers do begin to repeat themselves if they've had the opportunity that I've had to write all my adult life so that I've really had the opportunity to say what I have to say. And writing's too hard work, even if you're well, to spend it repeating yourself. What I get in exchange is an alertness to the world around me that is blanked out when I'm working. There is a certain evening light that falls in the valley fields here on Galliano that reminds me of the golden light on the meadows of my childhood. And the deep woods here are as cool and dark as the redwoods. When the ferry carries off the summer people, I stay behind, an islander through all the seasons. Mr. Chancellor, would you now confer the degree Doctor of Letters honoris causa upon Jane Vance Rule. given the degree that I refuse to get with great pride, not only for myself, but for the numbers of my colleagues, gay and lesbian, who have worked so hard for so many years to make this a more welcoming place for people of all differences. 30 years ago, when my first novel came out, there was some question about whether I was going to go on teaching at UBC because of that novel which was, um, among other things, about two women in love. But my colleagues came to my defense with an age-old argument that writers of murder mysteries were not necessarily murderers. <clears throat> so as a not necessarily murderer, I went on teaching at UBC. I think the thing that is most important to me to say to you today is that each of us is made up of a number of minorities some of them privileged, some of them problematic. I am white, I am well-educated, and I am well-off. Those privileges could teach me to be smug, judgmental, and condescending. Or they could teach me to take responsibility for the gifts I have and compassion for those who have not been so blessed. I am also a woman, a lesbian, <clears throat> and an arthritic. Any of these could have taught me to be a bitter victim. I hope they have taught me instead courage and humor. I have written about those values. I have tried to speak about characters who learn to be self-actuating, self-defining, to take no labels, whether it be not quite a murderer or maybe almost as good as one of the boys, but for each of you to define yourselves out of your many minorities, out of your many blessings and your many burdens. And in that integration of self, you will be self-defining and you can go into the world and do your work with joy. I wish you well in it. Thank you. Every artist seems to me to have the job to bear witness to the world we live in. To some extent, I think of all of us as artists because we have voices and we are each of us unique. And so if we don't bear witness as citizens, as people, as individuals, the right that we have had to life is sacrificed. There is a silence instead of a speaking presence. <laughs> I mean, they make me want to be taller, you know, they're so tall. 
she knew that she was way too tall for the for the ideal, of course. I always associated Jane and her family with the redwoods of California. Uh, I didn't think they were larger than they should be. I thought they were just right.